Good evening. Welcome to News 360. We're broadcasting live from the News Hub here at Adisonwe in Accra. My name is Solis Rose Corte. And I am Park Siasari. In the next 60 minutes, we've got a compilation of local plus international stories. News 360 Headlines is brought to you by... Agogo Traditional Authority in the Ashanti region warns against the lease of land to nomadic headsmen as pressure mounts to evict them. Now, fifth suspect in the Bantama gang rape case arrested. Also ahead in the bulletin, a survey by the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana reveals 52.7% of Ghanaians will vote for the new patriotic party and 33.1% for the National Democratic Congress if elections were held today. Now in business tonight, inflation inches up by 0.1% in December 2017. And elsewhere on the foreign front, rescue workers in Southern California search for survivors after mudslides and flooding in which at least 15 people have died. We've got details of these and many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Uh, remember, you can join us with your views, comments and suggestions on any of our top headline stories this hour. Visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. The Asante Achim Agogo Traditional Council in the Ashanti region has warned against the lease of land to nomadic headsmen at Agogo as pressure mounts to get them evicted from the area. Now, Queen Mother of Agogo, Nana Jabin Afrakuma Kisi Abuadom, says the traditional authority backs the youth to fight what she describes as the cruelty, lawlessness and impunity of the nomads. A report by Benjamin Adu. The Ashanti Regional Security Council on Wednesday held a meeting with stakeholders at Agogo in the Ashanti Achim North District to resolve the perennial destruction of farmland by cattle and other nefarious activities by alien herdsmen in the area. On Monday, three soldiers and a police officer were wounded in a shooting incident between the herdsmen and a task force set up to evict the nomadic herdsmen from the town. Residents say they feel neglected by successive governments. They claimed more than 40 people have been killed by the headsmen, adding the government has not shown enough commitment towards ending the menace. But the Regional Security Council has beefed up the Joint Military Police Task Force to prevent matters from getting out of control. The Member of Parliament for Santia Chim North, Andi Apia, has appealed to government to implement a 2012 court ruling on the case. The Fulani Hesmen have not been given any lands here by the chiefs, calling on the authorities to act swiftly without fear or favor. Queen Mother of Agogo, Nana Jwaben Afrakuma Kisi Abuodum, says the traditional authority is concerned about the plight of residents. The Fulani headsmen should leave. I'm appealing to authorities to help end this menace once and for all. The Ashanti Regional Minister, Simon Ose Mensah, promised the court's decision on the issue will be implemented. We are going to look at the previous roadmap that my predecessors uh, set up. And then we review the whole roadmap and ensure that uh, those we think we cannot work with, we change them and add those we think are implementable and ensure that we resolve this problem once and for all. He noted the atrocities were becoming too many and will not tolerate any impunity. We make sure that the task force is going to do their work within the law. Uh, any resistance, uh, they should let us know. I don't think we are going to tolerate any impunity henceforth. Fulani headsmen who hitherto settled in the northern part of Ghana found their way to Agogo about a decade ago. In January 2012, the Kumasi High Court ordered the Regional Security Council to take immediate, decisive, efficacious and efficient action to flush out all cattle from Abroapong, 
Mankaila, Nyami Betre, Koreso, Adomimu, Beboso, and Braha Bebome, all in the Agogo traditional area, the only exception being cattle that have been properly confined in a permitted area. Now let's still stay in the Ashanti region because the fifth suspect in the Bantama gang rape case has been arrested. The four other accused persons were today remanded in juvenile cells to reappear in court on Wednesday, January 17. The five suspects are among seven boys accused of sexually assaulting a teenage girl at Bantama in Kumase. The Asukwa Juvenile Court, presided over by his worship, Peter Opombwahene, remanded the suspect after the prosecutor told the court investigations had not been concluded and that he would need more time. Lawyer for the juvenile suspect, John Bwama, confirmed the arrest of the fifth suspect. Someone else has also been arrested and that person is duly also represented. The person has legal representation. The juveniles have been asked to go back to the juvenile cells to come back next week. We are waiting for the prosecution. Relatives of the suspect thronged the court premises to witness the proceedings. This is the fourth time the suspects have been remanded. Away from the Ashanti region, let's go up north where the regent of Sangoli in the Saboba district of the northern region, Dalafula Bal II, has appealed to government to include the community in the One Village One Dam program to improve living conditions and also boost agriculture in the area. A dam which serves seven adjoining communities dries up annually during the dry season. A dam in the area dug 32 years ago dries from December to May each year, making portable water inaccessible over the period. This water is polluted and unsafe. Spokesperson for the region called on government to urgently intervene. The One Village One Dam policy is one of the Kufuado administration's flagship programs aimed at ensuring all year round agriculture in the three regions of the north through the construction of irrigation dams. Now, a survey by the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana has revealed that 52.7% of Ghanaians will vote for the MPP and 33.1% for the NDC if elections were held today. After a year in office, government received an approval rating of 62%. This is a report by Daniel Opoku. The research findings focused on the first year of the NPP administration. 5,000 respondents from 250 electoral areas in 50 constituencies across the country were sampled. Their focus was on the free SHS, creation of special prosecutor, the economy and unemployment. On free SHS, government scored 76.6% from the respondents, while 64% also lauded government for creating the special prosecutor's office. 41.4% of the view the office would be impartial, while 74% implored government to recruit a courageous and independent person. Head of the Political Science Department of the University of Ghana, Dr. Bosman Asari, entreated government to be fast with appointment. Although some voters expressed ambivalence, they were not so conveyed, but they thought that once the person is appointed, the person will be independent. And know this is something many Ghanaians are watching. Because we think that once you are creating another office, that means taxpayers' money will be used for that purpose. So we expect the government to do well in the fight against corruption. On the creation of new regions, 64.6% supported the idea and 31% said it will enhance administration, while 30% said it will lead to development. According to 44.9% of the respondents, the economy has improved, while 42.6% said it has not improved. Unemployment, 32% said it has reduced, while 35% disagreed. The findings indicate if elections were to be held today, the MPP would win. The 5,000 people we interviewed, in the 2016 election, 56% of them voted for the MPP, 56%, and almost 36% voted for the NDC. So, but now that same population, they are saying they will vote for the MPP by 52.7. 
All of the MPP will still win, is that not the case? But the people who voted for them, that has reduced by 3.3%. And that of the NDC has also reduced by some percentage points. So that means all, both parties have lost ground. So it's not like one party has benefited at the expense of the other. Meanwhile, findings from the survey also reveal that 58% of Ghanaians would want former President John Dramani Mahama to be elected flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress. Of the 5,000 respondents, 2,900 of them were of the opinion the former president was the best candidate for the NDC. The research revealed a lot of the respondents wanted former President Mahama to lead the NDC party. They based the assessment on his experience and his first taste at the presidency, which could inform his new policies if voted into power. Other contenders, Sylvester Mensa, Professor Joshua Alabi, Dr. Spio Gabra, and Kweku Rikit Hagan secured less than 7%. All of them are getting less than 7%. Some are even getting, so I was, we generally we were surprised. So that means there's a popular endorsement for Mr. Mahama. And if that happens, Ghanaians will, for the first time, have two candidates from the two major political parties who were once presidents. And they will be going at each other. And I believe that will probably be the final bout for each of them. An election observer with the political science department, K. Chilfrin Pong, noted other contenders would have to pull resources to challenge the former president. If he is so much ahead, then why wouldn't the other contenders think of maybe pulling resources together and giving him a good run for his money by supporting one candidate. Now let's still stick to some issues of surveys and majority of Ghanaians have expressed misgivings about the appointment of the chair of the Electoral Commission. According to a report by the Center for Media Analysis, Charlotte Ose is highly mistrusted by Ghanaians. The following is a news desk report. In the report, Charlotte Ose recorded 22% incompetency, 21% public mistrust, 20% sexual inducement, 18% corruptible character, and 19% political bias. The Center for Media Analysis, CMA, states all the framing thematic categories analyzed reveals the extent at which she was negatively portrayed in the media, which could dent her integrity, the office she holds, and the nation as a whole. The research also revealed that some framers portrayed her positively in the media, which, however, cannot outweigh the negative frame she recorded. Media analysts at CME have therefore urged individuals and institutions to be mindful of how they use the media to set certain framing precedents about political appointed leaders to preserve the integrity of the office they hold. While some express misgivings about the appointment, others were of the opinion that the former president made the right choice to replace Dr. Kojua Farijan, who retired. Prior to the 2016 general elections, Charlotte says credibility to conduct free and fair elections became a major issue of concern to some Ghanaians. This perception created in the mindset of the public was as a result of how some institutions and a cross-section of the public tagged her appointment as being unfair and politically motivated. However, controversies surrounding her credibility worsened when she was also accusing some financial malfeasance after the 2016 general elections, which is currently under probe. The media was a key platform used by the institutions and individuals to frame the easy chair, which likely caused her to be seen in a certain mindset of the public. All right, so let, let's take a closer look to the findings, um, or rather at the findings of the credibility test run by the CMA. Now, this is basically how the EC boss is perceived by the public. So on the level of incompetency, she rated 22%. Madame Charlotte Osei, EC chair, rated 22%. Also on um, public mistrust, she rated 21%. Um, sexual inducement was 20%, um, corruptible character, 18%, and then on political bias, she rated 19%. Now, on political bias as well, she unbiased, as in being not, her not being biased, she actually rated 
percent. So at least that gives you a fair idea of how people feel regarding her political or perceived political affiliations. Over to you, Parkwisi. Thank you very much, uh, Solis Wasquote. And uh, we're going to stay a while longer on the subject. It's one of our top stories uh, for the night. I'm joined in the studio by Dr. Mesan Malgbe, uh, who is the executive director of the Center for Media Analysis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Malgbe, for your time and good to have you uh, you. in the studio. Uh, this is a very raw uh, rankings uh, by your outfit. Uh, incompetence, 22%. Public mistrust, 21%. Sexual inducement, 20%. Corruptible character, 18% political bias, 19%. Let me start off first by asking why you'd want to re release such a report, the timing of it, when you know fully well that the, 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 the EC boss and her two deputies are currently before uh, the Judicial Committee set up by the Chief Justice. Thank you very much. It is actually the, this committee or this ongoing probe that constitutes our objective for this study in the sense that the moment these uh, financial allegations were leveled against the EC chair, certain opinion leaders were of the view that it is uh, politically motivated to actually get her out of office. So we start asking this scientific question, what could have led to that? The only possible mechanisms that could have led to this way of thinking or mindset is how this uh, Mrs. Charlotte Ose has been framed in the media. Framing is a very critical tool when it comes to how the media wants us to perceive or think about an object, about an entity, about a personality. Now, when you look at all the, the news content that were analyzed, the EC chair was framed in a highly negative context, one way or the other. And I must say specifically, this report goes a long way to even exonerate uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Charlotte uh, uh, say for the fact that she was unduly and unfairly framed. So Center for Media Analysis is actually urging uh, opinion leaders, political parties, organizations to be mindful of our choice of words, how we construct statements to frame contents or image about organizations and the high-end reputation of our leaders. Doc, uh, before you go any further, yes. unless you, uh, you have uh, differing opinions on, on the conclusion here, what you seek to suggest is that majority of Ghanaians have expressed misgivings about the appointment of the chair of the Electoral Commission. Is this a statement of fact? This is a fact. This is what has been consumed. According to your report? Yes, according to our is report. Is this a statement of yes, fact? Yes, That a majority fact. of Ghanaians yes. have expressed misgivings about the appointment of the chair of the Electoral Commission? Per the, per the research findings, every news item that we consume mm. leads to a perception mm. of what we have consumed. So the perception per all the news article in relation to the EC chair, she has been portrayed unduly in this negative context to the extent that majority of Guyanians that's, that's are That's where I have a yes. problem with uh, your findings. Because how do you say majority of Ghanaians when you uh, survey about 5,000 people? No, this is not, I think, I think maybe there's a mishap. This is a content, news content analysis. Mm -hmm. Where news content as a variable were analyzed, against a methodology known as news framing analysis. Perhaps I need to use this opportunity to explain what ahead. framing means. Go ahead. Framing is how the media wants us to think about something. And that something could either be a personality, an organization, an entity. So. Per all the uh, since how, how did you carry out your reports, first of all? You carry the report by doing what is called content analysis, framing analysis. You do a framing analysis by deconstructing all the contents. Contents that were geared towards the EC. So as a result of these frames, 
it becomes then very uh, challenging, for instance, for majority of Ghanaians to even perceive the ongoing processes, I mean, the, 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 the financial probe processes that is ongoing, because this framing precedent has been set already. Set by who? Set by the, the, the content that were pro projected in the media. And these contents were carried out by organizations, individuals. I'm not here as a scientist to, for instance, mention some of the organizations. So you but say that, for instance, the yes. media portrayed Madame Charlotte to say as uh, highly incompetent because you scored her about 22%, that there was public mistrust, that um, she got her job through sexual inducement, that she is a corruptible character, that she's politically biased, and okay. all these findings, all these conclusions, you got it from the media. Exactly. All these, all these are coming as content. But some would say it's a bit unfair because the appointment of the EC boss, many have said, was a highly political matter. There was a sharp divide between the NDC in power and yes. the NPP. So to say majority of Ghanaians and basing that you know, on the media, will be unfair, it, to no, say the least. Le let, me, let me answer that unfairness you're talking about. And that is why in every framing analysis, you look at the positive frame mm. and then the negative frame. Mm. Now, what, we, what you just mentioned or what you just touched on constitute the context of the negative frames. Let's look at the positive frames. Right. In terms of the positive frames, she was uh, presented in a frame of non-corruptible uh, uh, character with 22%. And then public trustworthiness was 57%. And also competency was 14%. And then on political bias, for instance, she had 0%. And then non sexual inducement was also 0%. But when you benchmark the positive framing against the negative framing, unfortunately, she was unduly and unfairly framed. So Center for Media Analysis is cautioning both the media, the opinion leaders, institutions to be very mindful as to how we framed institutions and how we frame hard-won reputations of our leaders. Uh, Look, I think I get your point, yes. but I, I, I need to situate it within a certain context. Please do. Um, that's why we are here. The, 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 the EC boss is currently facing the Judicial Committee. Uh, their findings currently ongoing, you know, the investigations ongoing. Exactly. Herself and her two deputies. Yes. Now, you come up with this report, uh, which is very damning of the perception of the EC boss. What will this report do to the committee? Yes, yeah, this, this report, let me read. CMA is of the view that... Mm. Unnecessary framing of institutions and individuals who act as a trigger for socio-political conflicts and should be avoided. For instance, because of this frame, mm. you, you rightly said that there were uh, different views in relation to the appointment, and that led to the frames. So no matter how we, uh, we disagree, uh, Center for Media Analysis is cautioning that we should be mindful of how we select the phraseology that we use to construct a particular frame within which we expect the public to perceive. Phraseology of a particular, of a particular frame to construct. I don't understand, seriously. For instance, for every, every news item that mm. we write, mm. let me say this. Every sentence has what we call subject and, and, and predicate. Mm. And each of these constitute or contribute to national discourses. The national discourse that has been construed out of this framing of the uh, EC chair has been very negative in the sense that she doesn't deserve that. So we are using this, for instance, to caution us. Now, another framing issues are bubbling up in this country. For instance, our president went to, had an interview with Al Jazeera. He made a point. We all know that he didn't mean to usurp the constitution of this country. 
But because of how the construction, the language construction was, was done, if you set it against the LGBT uh, rights that we read in the media yesterday, it, says a, it means that a certain frame through the construction from His Excellency the President, it becomes then murkier mm. for one to really appreciate. I need to ask this very final yes. question, sir. I beg you, uh, we're hard pressed yes. for time. I need to ask That's this very right. final question. So what you're saying is essentially cautioning the general public exactly. to be mindful exactly. of what they say about the EC boss. What, what we say about, not, not but, just about but, the EC boss, but, but organizations. But, but why, 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 why this time? One would have thought that you'd have waited for the committee to finish its findings because this, now you are telling us that all the perceptions that people have about her categorically are not true or may not be true. No, you agree with me that the committee is working with their own factual context. Mm. And as a social scientist mm. and a media scientist, we also have our factual context with our variable as the raw material being the news content. So they, they, they say there is an absolute disparity between the two. It can, it can, it can. Dr. Mambe, I've got to say a big thank you to you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much for your thank time. you. Thanks for joining us in studio. So that was uh, Dr. Mesa Malgbe. He is with the, his executive director of the Center for uh, Media Analysis. And uh, they just uh, recently came up with um, a survey uh, suggested that majority of Ghanaians uh, were expressing misgivings about the appointment of the chair of the Electoral Commission. You're still watching News 360 live from our news hub here in Accra. Let's do some other stories now. And the Energy Ministry has described as untrue claims by the minority in Parliament that the ministry, and for that matter, government has not made any proposal to the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission for a reduction in the electricity tariff contrary to what was stated in the 2018 budget. The ministry has also rubbished claims by the, that the PURC is contemplating a major increase in electricity tariffs and the fact that the ministry is meddling in the affairs of the PURC are all false. With the greatest of respects, the honorable member is not the guardian of truth. That is, the, he's not the repository of what is true or what is false. If it is not within his knowledge, respectfully, it is preposterous to assume that because he does not know, it is false. The Energy Minister Boache Jaku's spirited response comes on the back of claims by the minority that the PURC is considering increasing utility tariffs. Government in its 2018 budget last year indicated it had submitted proposals to the PURC to work out modalities for a downward review of electricity tariffs. The minority led by its spokesperson on mines and energy had indicated the ministry, for that matter government, was meddling in the affairs of the PURC. But the sector minister disagreed. Respectfully, it is preposterous to assume that because he does not know, it is false. The ministry sent a proposal to PURC on the 17th of November. And he is welcome to copies of these matters. Indeed, it is within his power as a ranking member to summon me to the Mines and Energy Committee for such a verification. It is within his power, and failing to do that in itself is an abrogation of responsibility to his committee and to the people of this country. The minister says the PURC has not communicated its intention to increase tariffs, noting a major review of tariffs does not necessarily mean an increase as misunderstood by the minority. The minister was speaking at the Maiden CEO's forum under the auspices of the National Petroleum Authority, where he urged the Petroleum Commission and the GMPC to aggressively pursue basin promotion in the eastern, central and Volta regions to attract investors in the extractive industry.
Let's move on and do some other stories. And President Akufu Addo has sworn in Ghana's High Commissioner to Malaysia, Ikea Sichiwa Ahinkra, charging her to ensure Ghana taps into the expertise of Malaysia in the oil palm industry. The newly appointed Malaysian High Commissioner, Ikea Sichiwa Ahinkra, worked with the President when he was a Foreign Affairs Minister during the John Kufu administration. President Ikufado said Malaysia and Ghana attained independence in the same year, in 1957. However, Malaysia has taken giant economic steps, particularly in the oil palm sector. The President urged the High Commissioner to work hard to ensure Ghana taps the expertise of Malaysia in the palm oil industry. They are still struggling with a few tons of palm oil and they are producing the greatest amount in the world and are deriving huge benefits from it. There's a great deal that we can derive from our relations with them. You're going to be at the cutting edge of developing those relations and intensify the economic exchanges between Malaysia and Ghana. The newly appointed High Commissioner pledged to work to improve trade relations between the two countries. Your Excellency, I am aware also of your my responsibility to drive private sector investment into Ghana to help in achieving the government's flagship programs of the one district, one factory, the one village, one dam, planting for food and jobs, and the overall objective of developing Ghana beyond aid. You're still watching News 360 Live from our news hub here in Accra. We'll take a short break. Thanks for staying with us on News 360. Let's do business now. My name is Nanikia Mensah Brampa. Now, results of basing the country's economy in terms of its gross domestic product, that is the GDP, is expected to be released this year, with 2013 as the new base year. The rebasing is to take a look at the situation of the economy and take account of new development in the economy. Now, currently, Ghana's GDP is calculated with 2006 as the base year. United Nations Statistical Commission recommends that countries rebase their economies every five years. A revised GDP number will impact on key dependent ratios such as debt to GDP, fiscal deficits to GDP, trade to GDP, tax to GDP compared to other countries. A lower debt to GDP and deficits to GDP after rebasing will give government some breathing space to borrow to drive national development. Acting government statistician Bawadier noted the recalculation is necessary as the old national accounting system does not take into account important emerging sectors of the economy. We realize that we have ICT being a, a very significant part of our expenditure and our activities, daily activities. In a, say 10 years ago, it wasn't like that. So when we are rebasing, we are we trying to take account of some of these new developments. Rebasing an economy may be seen as a cosmetic exercise because it may not immediately affect the daily lives of most people. Nevertheless, it has a number of principal benefits and important implications that will help improve the economy and by extension the lives of the citizenry in the long run. There is nothing wrong with getting our statistics right, which means those charged with managing the economy will now have much more credible information on the GDP. A few years ago, we didn't have oil and gas as we are having it now. When we did the previous rebasing, we couldn't take that into full effect. The upstream and the downstream, all the investments that have come into oil, we didn't have them previously. We also want to bring in the new methods and technology in doing some of these things so that we can measure better, we can measure faster. Economic indicators are used to make critical national decisions that allocate scarce resources and it is absolutely vital to ensure they are accurate. The new size and status of the economy will definitely have a psychological impact on foreign investment. 
A revised GDP number and its composition will reveal more about the current economy. Now, meanwhile, inflation for December last year was 11.8%, up by 0.1 percentage points from the 11.7% recorded in November 2017. Now, this means the country's inflation in 2017 was 11.8% compared to government's end-of-year projection of 11.2%. The Consumer Price Index EPI measures changes over time in the general price level of goods and services that households acquire for consumption. The ancient app of consumer price inflation by 0.1% is attributed to increase in inflation rates on transport, fish and seafood. The main price drivers for the non-food inflation rate were clothing and footwear with a rate of 18.8% transport, 18.7%, recreation and culture, 17.5%, and furnishings, household equipment, and routine maintenance, a rate of 15.2%. And the price drivers for the food inflation rate were vegetables, a rate of 10.0%, and fish and seafood, a rate of 8.8%. The year-on-year -year inflation rate for non-food items in December last year was 13.6%, just as was recorded in November. Non-food inflation was consistently higher than food inflation last year. Okay. Acting government statistician Bawa Die explains non-food items are more responsive to policy directives. Transport is the response to adjustments in fuel prices. If it comes to housing, water, electricity and gas, they are also responsive to policies in ad price adjustments. Most of the items there too are also very responsive to fluctuations in the exchange rates. And most of them are, have imported components as well. The year-on-year -year inflation rate for imported items was 13.6%, which was 2.5 percentage points higher than that of locally produced items. Upper West Greater Accra, Buna Hafu and Ashanti regions recorded inflation rates higher than the national average of 11.8%. Upper West recorded the highest inflation rate of 12.8%, followed by Greater Accra with 12.7%, while Upper East recorded the lowest year-on-year -year inflation of 10.2% in December. And on banking, Societe General Ghana has rewarded customers at its third mini draw in the Abeng Wahat promotion at Tema. In all, 30 winners received a variety of prizes, including flat screen television sets and smartphones. The Abeng Wahat promotion was launched in August last year to encourage customers to save. New and existing customers had to make deposits of a minimum of 200 cities and grow it to 1,000 cities and above before December 31st, 2017. The deposit must be in the account until January 31st, 2018 to qualify for the final draw to win one of the six Suzuki Balino cars in February 2018. At its third mini draw at Tema, 30 customers won a variety of items, including smartphones, flat screen TV sets, and airtime worth 100 cities each. From the Premier Towers, Bernard Asari Kunbia. Bernard Asari Kunbia from the Premier Towers. And he wins a Samsung Galaxy Grand Prime. It's been very successful, having in mind that the period in which the promotion ran was a festive period, a typical period where people tend to spend. And uh, you find people having difficulty, having money to put aside. You come January, you find people are a bit tight up. So we want people to learn and put away something to use in the future. There will be one more draw in Kumase before the final draw in Accra, where six lucky customers will win a brand new car each. We have a running loan campaign for those of you who are salaried workers. We've been running a low campaign since November and it's going to end this month, at the end of this month. So you have a few weeks to take advantage of the best loan offer in this country. The best. No challenger. If anybody has anything better, bring it to our attention. We'll do better than that. 
Societe General is focused on satisfying the needs of its customers with innovative products and services which would ultimately improve shareholder value. Thank you so much. We have... All right, that's it for business tonight. There's more on 2news.com. My name is Nanikia Mensa Abrampa. I return with sports. is News 360. After 13 grueling weeks of competition, Ghana's most beautiful queens deserved some fun. The queens touched down at the Kutukwa International Airport earlier today after spending three days in Dubai in fulfillment of their pageant winning package. Exhausted yet excited, GMB 2017 winner Zainab and first runner-up Baba could not hide their joy on returning home. When you got to the airport the first time, what was your reaction? My reaction was like, wow, beautiful. Very soon Ghana will turn to Dubai. Yes, as tourism ambassadors, as cultural ambassadors of Ghana. So what would you do to contribute to the brand that we have as a country? And I think when we are together, we we'll actually achieve a whole lot of things like, and then even foreigners coming to our country to also see what we have and also help us a lot. In Dubai, they don't really play with their tax payments. Anything at all you buy in Dubai, you pay a tax. So with that, it's also help in their development. So when we also do that, it will help a lot. What we can do in our own little way is anywhere we find ourselves, we would have to lift high the flag of Ghana by looking at the kind of clothes we wear when we go outside, the language. We're even able to teach some foreigners our language. Really? Yes. Let's round off your trip in three words. My trip was amazing. It was fun and I really enjoyed everything I did in Dubai. It was exciting, relaxing and educative. The trip was thanks to Kenya Airways and Satguru Travel and Tourism. Watch out for more highlights on Ghana's most beautiful, the Dubai Experience. Right. GMV 2017. Trace out of Ghana. <laughs> Definitely straight out of Ghana. That's how we wrap up News 360 here. My name is Solis Rose Corti. And I'm Parkwis Yasari. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you same time tomorrow.